Irishman Danny Green and the Celtic Club versus the Cleveland Italian Mafia. In 1976, Cleveland, Ohio would be dubbed Bomb City, USA due to a bloody and lethal turf war between the Italian mob and the Irishman Danny Green and his crew of Irish gangsters known as the Celtic Club. Although bombs and car bombings was Green's preferred method of assassination for many years, from 1974 to 1976, the amount of bombings in Cleveland was particularly inflated after Green would align himself with an Italian gangster, gun trafficker, and drug dealer, John Nardi, who decided to go to war with his fellow Italian mobsters after the death of Cleveland crime family boss John Scalise in his attempt to overthrow the family. But before I break down the war between Green and the Italians, let's first get an understanding of the Irishman Danny Green. Daniel John Patrick Green was born on November 14, 1933 in Cleveland, Ohio, to parents Irene and John Green. But Danny's mother Irene would pass away just three days after his birth due to medical complications, leaving his father devastated, who would turn to alcohol to drown his sorrows, causing him to lose his job, and ultimately unable to take care of Danny, he would be placed in an orphanage on the outskirts of Cleveland after spending a short time under his grandfather's care. When his father remarried when he was six, he would bring Green back to live with him. But the young Danny Green did not get along with his new stepmother and would end up back with his grandfather for the remainder of his childhood. In high school, Green would often get into beefs and brawls with the Italian-American kids from the neighborhood because of his Irish heritage, causing Green to carry on a strong distaste for Italians into his adult life. Although Green excelled in sports, his academics weren't exactly the greatest, causing Green to leave behind school and join the United States Marine Corps. Green would be recognized for his skills in boxing and shooting and eventually be promoted to corporal and then later honorably discharged the same year. After the military in 1960, Green would begin working as a longshoreman at the Cleveland Docks and in 61 would become interim president of the ILA International Longshoremen's Association, and then won the next election, making him official president. And the first move he would make is having the union office painted green and installed thick green carpet to represent his Irish heritage. According to different sources, it was around that time that Green had begun studying about Ireland and its turbulent history, and began considering himself a Celtic warrior, who would consider to be some of the most distinctive fighters in ancient history, which is where many believe Green got his desire to start getting involved in the criminal underworld. It said Green ruled the docks with an iron fist, forcing them to kick up more union dues for a quote, building fund, and using job security to get workers to comply, and would often declare work stoppages to show his power to company owners, and in one case threatened to kill a company owner's two kids, causing the FBI to put them under their protection. Fast forward to 1964, Danny Green would be convicted of embezzlement of union funds and stripped of his union position after an investigative reporter named Sam Marshall found evidence of extortion. The case was eventually overturned and Green, wanting to avoid another trial, would plead guilty to falsifying union documents and was hit with a $10,000 fine. He would receive a suspended sentence, although Green would never pay the fine or serve any time in prison. It has been speculated that Green began cooperating with the FBI as a top echelon informer as an explanation as to why Green would never serve any time in prison. It said Green was recruited by head of the FBI Organized Crime Division, Marty McCann, but Green, who allegedly was referred to by codename Mr. Patrick, would only give information that benefited him and would never help the FBI hurt anyone close to him. After being forced to leave the dockyards, Green would find employment with the Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild under Shonda Burns, a notorious killer, pimp, loan shark, and numbers organizer, as an enforcer who Green met while working for the Longshoremen's Union. Burns was impressed with Green and would use him as an enforcer for his number rackets. On top of doing work for Burns, Danny Green would help Cleveland Mafia underboss Frank Little Frank Broncado to enforce the mob's influence over the garbage hauling contracts, as well as other rackets. But according to sources online, Brancato would later regret bringing Green into the mob's rackets because of mistakes he made in regards to certain hit attempts 
such as a 1968 car bombing on a black numbers runner who's trying to avoid paying protection dues when Green almost killed himself when detonating a car bomb on the man and was thrown 20 feet and permanently damaged a hearing in his right ear. After nearly blowing himself up, it said Green no longer handled bombs himself, but instead used various professionals to deal with the bombs for him. The Cleveland Solid Waste Trade Guild would fall apart after one of the members, Big Mike Fredo, broke away and started his own more legitimate trade group called Cuyahoga County Refuse Haulers Association and began protesting about Green using strong arm mob tactics which Green would respond by hiring a man named Art Snepperger to place a bomb on Fredo's car. But Snepperger had second thoughts and told Fredo Green's request, and, ru and rumor has it, Snepperger, who was also an informant, told Cleveland police about the plans. Around a year later, Green instructed Snepperger to plant a bomb on Fredo's car again, but the bomb detonated early, killing Snepperger while Fredo was across the street, untouched. And although the case was never solved, according to a Cleveland police sergeant, street sources had told him Green intentionally detonated the bomb early as a response to Snepperger informing Fredo of Green's plans. Green would eventually be arrested for the murder of Fredo on November 26, 1971, but released after police determined he was acting in self-defense. According to Danny Green, while he was jogging with his dogs at White City Beach in Cleveland, Fredo, who was passing by in a car, fired three shots at Green, to which Green responded by firing one shot and hitting him and killing him. Cleveland police would later determine that Fredo, who was once so close to Green that both Green and Fredo named their sons after each other, had an opportunity a week prior to kill the Irishman but didn't. Shortly after the Fredo incident, again while at White City Beach, another hit attempt would be made on Green, but this time by a sniper who was positioned a couple hundred feet away. The man took several shots at Green, who countered by pulling out a revolver and returning fire while charging in the direction of his attempted hitter. But he was able to escape from Green, and police would later learn he was sent by Shonda Burns. Following the second attempt on Green's life, he would leave his wife and kids behind and move to another neighborhood called Collinwood to help make sure they were safe. Green was said to take pride in his neighborhood and according to one reporter, Ned Whalen, Green supported multiple destitute families in his Collinwood neighborhood. He had 50 20 pound turkeys he gave to needy households on Thanksgiving, paid multiple children's Catholic school tuition, and would pick up tabs at restaurants and leave generous tips. Green was even said to have evicted a bookmaker who was operating out of a business in Waterloo and would make personal visits to a local Collinwood bar to help keep things in order. When a group of Hells Angels members moved into Collinwood acting a little too rowdy, Green walked up to her headquarters with a stick of dynamite, threatening to throw it inside unless the bikers came out to hear his message for the men to keep things quiet in the neighborhood. Along with partnering with John Nardi, member of the Cleveland crime family, the Irishman would form his own crew of Irish-American gangsters known as the Celtic Club, featuring members Jimmy, the ice pick Sterling, who had gambling dens set up all over the city of Cleveland, Art Snepager, aka Snep, Ernest Ted Waite, Elmer Britton, Billy McDuffie, Brian O'Donnelly, and his two enforcers, Kevin McTaggart and Keith the Enforcer Ritson. The relationship between Green and Burns would go bad and Green asked Burns to borrow $75,000 in cash so he could open up a new bar and gambling den, which Green referred to as a cheap spot. Burns agreed to help and got the money loaned from members of the Gambino family. But when the money was supposedly lost by Burns runner Billy Cox, when he purchased cocaine instead, and the police raided his home and took the cocaine and what was left of the money. Green would also survive another two bombing attempts. One, a powerful bomb that failed to explode, and another one that blew up his 15805 Waterloo Road building, causing the second floor to collapse while Green was up there with his girlfriend. They rolled the floor down, ultimately being shielded by a refrigerator. They suffered minor injuries. Green would go on 
to anger the mafia some more when he started a vending machine racket and started muscling his way into the gambling operations throughout Cleveland. One man in particular, family soldier Thomas the Chin Man Sanito, who started a back and forth between him and Green over a lucrative coin-operated laundry contract, which Green had control over at the time. Thomas Sanito, along with fellow Cleveland associate Joseph Joey Luce Lacabachi, murdered one of the members of Green's Celtic Club, and Green would respond by strapping a stick of dynamite to Sanito's car, but it failed to go off. John Conti, a mob figure and close friend of the Cleveland Mafia capo Joe Gallo, would also fall victim to the vending route wars between Green and the Italians. He would last be seen telling his wife he was going to a meeting with Green to discuss business regarding the local vending rackets and was later found beaten to death in the Cleveland suburbs of Austin Town. Green would be linked to the crime by blood evidence, but he was never charged. After the death of Mafia family boss John Scalish, Cleveland would have a bloody war over control of the rackets. Scalish was the successor to boss Alfred Polisi after Polisi retired to Florida. Scalish reign as boss would last 32 years from the 1940s to the 1970s. He was most known for leading the Cleveland family during the mob's takeover of Las Vegas and California and was present during the infamous 1957 Appalachian meeting in upstate New York. Scalish was said to be a powerful and respected boss, having his hand in casino shakedowns, labor union rackets, as well as help develop other casinos, a major hospital, and many various other projects in Las Vegas. After Scalish died during heart surgery in 1976, he left behind a bunch of now open rackets, which caused a bloody and deadly turf war, mainly over his labor union rackets, between new boss James T. Licavoli and the Irishman Danny Green. Green and his partner Nardi within the next few weeks would go on to kill many of Licavoli's men, including Frank Perico, who was moving Alfred Ali Calabrese's car so he could get his own car out. He was blown up, as well as Licavoli's underboss, Leo Lips Masseri, and seriously injured his main enforcer, Eugene the Animal Casulo. These hits would cause an all-out war between Licavoli's Cleveland crime family and Danny Green in the Celtic Club, causing Cleveland to earn the moniker Bomb City USA after 36 bombs exploded in Cleveland in 1976 alone, even causing the ATF to triple up their staff in the northeast area of Ohio. In the book Kill the Irishman, Danny Green by author Rick Perello, he wrote that Green killed eight different assassins who were sent to kill him, using both bombs and bullets. Green, who was feeling invincible after surviving all the murder attempts, went on a press run, bragging to different television stations, giving interviews, posing for newspaper photographers, and even said to one reporter, quote, the luck of the Irish is with me, and I have a message for those yellow maggots. That includes the payers and the doers. The doers are the people who carried out the bombing. They have to be eliminated because the people who paid them can't afford to have them remain alive. And the payers are going to feel great heat from the FBI and local police. And let me clear something up. I didn't run away from the explosion, I walked away. Someone said they saw me running, I walked away. Green was also quoted saying, I'm an Irish Catholic. I believe that the guy upstairs pulls the strings and you're not going to go until he says so. It just wasn't my time yet. And on another television interview, after denying any involvement in an underworld war, he would go on to say, I have no ax to grind, but if these maggots in this so-called mafia want to come after me, I'm over here by the Celtic Club. I'm not hard to find. A ballsy move on Green's part. Green's longtime partner in crime, John Nardi, would be killed by a car bomb on May 17, 1977, planted by Ronald Carabia and Pasquale, Sister Nino. Licavoli would then order a ceasefire with Green in his attempt to throw Green off so he could catch him slipping. But not long after their agreement, Green would once again muscle in on Italian gambling rackets, which were run by Nardi. And although Green offered Licavoli a percentage, Licavoli turned it down. Somehow the Cleveland Mafia was able to tap Green's phone, 
and heard he had set up a dentist appointment at the Brainerd Place office building in Lynnhurst, Ohio, and would use this information to take Green out. While Green was inside, it said that a hitman named Ray Ferrito was the man who would plant the bomb on the car next to Green's, which would result in Green being killed instantly as he was about to enter his car. Green would be cremated on October 8, 1977 and buried at Cleveland's Calvary Cemetery. Ray Ferrito would end up being charged with Green's murder and would tell authorities that Jimmy Fradiano, aka Jimmy the Weasel, who's acting boss of the Los Angeles crime family, was responsible for the planning of the Green hit. Fradiano was indicted on charges related to the bombing, but would turn government witness and in exchange for giving information on the mob, he would plead guilty to murder charges, receiving only a five-year sentence and serving only 21 months. Fradiano's testimony in 1980 would lead to the convictions of five mafia members on racketeering charges. Following his testimony, Fradiano would enter the witness protection program and would go on to write books about his time in organized crime and would later admit to supposedly murdering five people back when he was working for the mob. As far as the Irishman Danny Green's legacy, According to neighbors and friends, Green was like the Robin Hood of Collinwood, often helping out everyone in need, whether it be school tuitions, paying people's rent, or helping out an elderly widow by buying her a washing machine she couldn't afford. Danny Green was well liked and well respected in his community. The Irishman was heavily entrenched in his Irish heritage and was said to be studying the warriors of Celtic Europe and were known to be some of the most distinctive of any fighters. Celtic warriors had an intimidating appearance, known for their tall height, mustaches, long hair, and often naked with tattooed or painted bodies, and were also known for collecting the heads of their enemies they killed in battle. The Romans would describe the Celts as being preoccupied with war and were considered war heroes. The Celtic warriors believed that war was a tool to be used to acquire prestige, power, wealth, vengeance, and land. In other words, their philosophy was, if I want it, I'll kill you and take it. And the more powerful you were, the more prestige you would receive. And the Celts were also expected to be generous to their followers. Green would adapt this philosophy and take it to the streets of Cleveland and go to war with the Italian mob, taking what he wanted, regardless of whose it was. Celtic warriors were also known for their bravery in battle, which you could see in Green as he would never run away from battle, but instead run towards it. Right before Green is killed by the car bomb, as you can see in the movie Kill the Irishman, which was a great movie, Danny Green stops and talks to some kids, and he takes off his gold Celtic protection pendant and gold chain and gives it to the kid named Todd, while at the same time he sees his killer drive by, but when the man keeps going, Green seemed relieved. He then walked to his car and was blown up. According to an article online, this part of the movie was true. There's a few stories that have been speculated online that I would like to touch on. One, including James T. Licavoli, aka Jack White, is said to have ties with Chicago gangsters and the New York Gambino family who were growing impatient with Licavoli after Green and Nardi took out most of his men and Licavoli had yet to kill them. So it's said that the men had created a plot to lure Green to New York where they would get him to go to a meatpacking plant in New Jersey controlled by Gambino boss Paul Castellano but the plan never came to fruition. But Licavoli was congratulated by former Genovese front boss Frank Funzi Thierry of New York for taking out Green and Nardi. A few more things about Green I would like to touch back on, one being Shonda Burns, first hired Danny Green as an enforcer and loan shark collector, was part of the Jewish mafia, and Green himself got mixed up with the Italians through John Nardi. Green had also met Jimmy Hoffa through a man named Babe Triscaro, to which Hoffa was later quoted saying, stay away from that guy, there's something wrong with him. Green was said to be a super tough and excellent fighter, who was said to be a charismatic smooth talker, who was also vain. It's also said later in life, Green would get hair plugs and would exercise and tan frequently. Also, when the bomb backfired on Green, it turns out it was TNT that had too short of a fuse. And when he threw it, it hit his car and bounced back at him, causing a shattered eardrum in his right ear, and his own car even exploded. Word is that when police came to question him, he told them, the bomb hurt my ears, I can't hear you. Following this incident, Green spent years studying the art of bombing and hired Snepperger, 
a bomb expert to carry out his hits. Along with the bombings on Green's building, his office was also blown up as well in 1975. The Irishman was also said to be responsible for 75 to 80 percent of the bombings that occurred in Cleveland from the 1960s to the 1970s over a 10 year span. Some articles state that it was two men who planted the bomb on Green's Chevy Nova that would ultimately result in Green's death. In addition to being an enforcer for the Jewish and Italian mobs, Green was also running his own gambling, loan sharking, and racketeering outfits in Cleveland. Danny Green's death led to the 22 convictions for Green's murder and other crimes and sparked a 70-day murder trial causing a domino effect that would incriminate mobsters from New York to Los Angeles due to Cleveland mobsters turning federal witness. This is the part where I tell you guys to go smash the like and subscribe buttons and hit the notification bell to get notifications on all new videos. Also, you can now join the Wise Guy family by clicking the join button and kicking up a small fee to receive extra perks. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can now click the super thanks button, the heart with the dollar sign under the video, or click my cash app or Venmo link in the description. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you for your support and thank you for watching. Until next time, it's Wise Guy TV.